I think this might be the most important video I've ever made regarding remelanation. Many of you are emailing me now and asking me where I've been and what am I doing. But I talked in my last video about how I would be taking a little break from making videos for a while while I tried out this new routine. I would make another video once I could report the results. And since the results are amazing, getting better and better each and every day, I'm ready to share. Hey, it's Dave. So to start off, I think there are a few different parts to what I've discovered. Each part of what I've discovered is equally important. Some require more effort than others, but in my book, they're all worth it to recover how I've recovered. It starts out with minor changes and minor changes are popping up all over the place, almost daily now for me. And I am on top of the world. They are creating this deep sense of happiness in me. I feel like I've had it. I have it. The gold mine of remyelination. You may think losing myelin is only an MS thing. True, while MS is one of the hallmarks of MS is myelin loss. It's not exclusive to MS. Many conditions can cause it. But in MS, our big problem is we can't generate replacement myelin, a combination of MS genes, which we all have, and environmental factors. So I, I, I host a weekly chat for my Patreon members. Recently, I had a woman join. She told me, she told the group she was experiencing myelin loss due to an infection, but she didn't have MS. So ask any of my members. I, I don't think any of us were, were surprised when she was only a member for a few weeks. Her farewell message to all of us was to thank everyone for all the support we gave, had provided her, but as I said, all of her symptoms had left. And that's an example of how quickly most people can make new myelin. In the early years after our MS diagnosis, we can recover myelin quickly, kind of like that but it's rocky, it's the on again, off again, start of symptoms in the beginning is a sign of myelin coming back and going away, then coming back then going away. Symptoms start, then go away. New symptoms start, then leave. Then some symptoms start and never leave. Get the point? It's a rocky road, that's all I can say, that eventually leads to myelin stopping altogether and not returning. It's a whole, it's not just one thing. We have a whole combination of but all of our things, immune system, MS genes, and environment. I often hear from people who watch YouTube videos from various doctors who claim to have cured MS. The latest was just the other day. <laughs> they, they commented that a doctor I had never heard of reverses MS holistically. I hate that word holistic. When I hear that word holistic, my guard instantly shoots up. Nobody is who is in the know about MS li even listens to a holistic doctor. So I, I did a little fun. 
I, I researched it and dug a little deeper. Apparently, it was this mind-gut immunity clinic, uh, but it appears to be a pure money grab, preying on the sick to line their own wallets. Don't be fooled by people like this. Don't pay attention to those who claim to fix all autoimmunity diseases. I have a real resentment for, towards people trying to profit from suffering, whatever kind, MS or not. So you may ask, what's the alternative? Well, how about this? How about scientific proof and fact? So the fact is, wrapping the nerves in our brain and spinal cord are specific type of brain cells called oligodendrocyte precursor cells. It doesn't matter how old you are, we all have them. They start out immature before developing into mature oligodendrocytes. Now, once that happens, they are the only cells, only, the only thing that are able to make and maintain myelin. But here is the big problem MS patients have. Oligodendrocyte precursor cells, I think I'll call them OPCs for short from now on, they don't act the same in MS patients as they do in the general population. When scientists studied the scars postmortem of MS patients who died, they noted that the patient's OPCs had flooded damaged nerves. So proof, they are there, but they had stopped developing. Myelin repair was either incomplete or there was no remyelination at all. Now that I've explained that a little bit, came back to my Patreon friend. Yes, she had an infection, but as I said, it wasn't MS. What sets her apart from MS patients is that her OPCs react and proliferate rapidly and can differentiate into myelinating all the good nitrocytes and replace damaged myelin that was caused by her infection. So it's no big surprise. She was only a Patreon member for a few weeks. Now you might may wonder, and so I'll ask, if you're wondering how many OPCs we usually have, the adult human brain comprises of anywhere between two to eight percent. So it's a considerable part. It's an understatement to say our OPCs need help to develop and start doing what they are meant to do. <sighs> okay, all that aside, here's the source of my excitement. There is a pill, a medication. It's unrelated to its original intent, but it's, it's the way it acts is it acts on a specific receptor on the surface of these OPCs called the M1 muscarinic receptor. In MS patients, it's overactivated, which stops the transformation of OPCs into those myelinating oligodendrocytes. It's a medicine called clomastine, developed initially to treat allergies. I'll put a link down in the description by a, a neurologist, Dr. Brandon Bieber, discussing the studies that have been performed. Clomastine was initially patented in 1960, so it's been a while. <laughs> and so it's really not used as, a, as an antihistamine anymore, considering it's been 64 years. Newer, better allergy drugs have replaced it with less sedative effects. So when I set out, I, I of course want to go find if I can grab some clomastine for myself. And I didn't even know if it was still available. It was hard to find. 
and I searched different pharmacies, but I could only find it on the Amazon pharmacy, but it's still out there. They say that it's over the counter, but it's not. It's only available by prescription. So since I needed a prescription, that led me to contact my own neurologist who was kind enough to write said prescription. She told me I would have to pay full price as insurance doesn't cover it specifically for MS. If you watch Dr. Bieber's video, you'll discover clamassine has a unique quality that doesn't even relate to allergies. You know, and I told you, it stops that M1 mescalinic receptor. So I, I've, I've researched all about the M1 muscarinic receptor and they say the exact result of stopping the receptor has yet to be fully understood. Several theories have been proposed, but there is one in particular I gravitate to more than the others. The theory states that the overactivation of the receptor stops the proliferation of OPCs. Once clamassine removes that blocking signal, OPCs will resume their normal activity. There is a study involving clamastine and remyelination performed at the University of Cambridge, England. They enrolled MS patients with optic neuritis. And the study was positive. Remyelination was indeed taking place. There is an obstacle though which I've talked about many times before. With age, our OPCs stop responding to clamastine's effects. The study found that fasting wakes up these aged OPCs. To add even more evidence, I found an article that talks about how MIT biologists found fasting dramatically improves stem cell regeneration ability in both aged and young mice. If you've watched me for any time at all, you know how long I've been promoting the OMAD diet. Fasting for 24 hours makes cells switch from the usual burning of glucose to metabolizing and burning fatty acids. Fasting limits the intake of carbohydrates that can raise blood sugar levels. High blood sugar levels cause the body to produce inflammatory molecules in the central nervous system, which is terrible for us. But for remyelination, glucose enhances the activation of the M1 muscarinic receptor. And that is an absolute no-go in my book. Having moderate and stable blood sugar is vital for remyelination because fluctuations in blood sugars can affect and damage the functions of the cells involved in the repair process of our myelin. So once I read that, all bets are off. It made, me, it made me realize I would ha need to start pricking my finger and doing blood draws like a diabetic to monitor and control what my body was doing with glucose. The blood draw itself is easy and painless. Once I get the reading from, my, from the meter, I log it directly into my Fitbit app. When I first started logging my glucose levels, I would get jumps that would frankly surprise me. But I quickly learned how to manage them following three points. The biggest elephant in the room, and the one you probably can initially guess, is added sugar. I know that sounds obvious, but even things like old fashioned oatmeal which doesn't taste sweet in the slightest, contains starch, which, at least in me, does increase my blood glucose levels. The same goes for my morning coffee. 
caffeine can affect blood sugar levels, but research is mixed on whether it can or cannot. Again, thanks to my blood, blood draws, I can report for certain in me, it does. And the last point pertains to my high days. I could most definitely eat all my 4,160 calories in one meal, but doing so would shoot my glucose levels high and probably remain that way for longer than I would want. So I've spread it over three hours, intermixing it with exercise. I'll explain exactly what I do in a bit. I want to, I want to keep my blood glucose between 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter. The Cambridge study said they had participants follow an alternate day fast. I'll be honest, I did practice that for a few weeks, but I'm I'm not doing it anymore. I'm talking about an actual fast, meaning zero food, zero calories, and the only water. I I could I couldn't keep it up because I was losing too much muscle strength. I researched more into it and found that a one meal a day diet works just as well, with one caveat. I created a zigzag routine that I works because I can consume all my protein, but remain below my maintenance level on my low days. I know I'll be asked, so I'm going to show you exactly what I eat both days. Let me start with my high days. Every morning, no matter whether it's a high day or a low day, I start with a, about uh, one and a half tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. It contains lactic acid, which can help lower blood sugar by helping store excess uh, glucose in the liver. This reduces the body's rate of glucose production and absorption. I learned from a video by Jason Fung that timing the order in which I eat is crucial. I used to start with a big bowl of old fashioned oatmeal, like I said, but Jason recommends starting with vegetables and protein. So I changed everything. Now I start with my salads, containing around four cups of romaine lettuce, two large red bell peppers, and four stalks of green onions. I top those two salads with a cup or eight ounces of boneless, skinless chicken breast and two tablespoons of a homemade salad dressing of olive oil, avocado oil, and red wine vinegar. I then eat half a cup of black beans and three fried eggs. The black beans contain eight grams of fiber and three eggs pack an impressive 19 grams of protein. Fiber helps lower blood glucose levels by slowing down digestion. Soluble fiber forms a gel that slows carbohydrate absorption while nourishing beneficial gut bacteria for better blood glucose regulation. So looking at my meal so far, the combination of protein in my chicken salads and eggs gives me roughly about 85 grams of high quality protein. Protein can slow glucose absorption by influencing the rate by which carbohydrates are broken down and absorbed in the digestive system. Just search Jason Fung's YouTube page for Why Food Order Matters. His graphs highlight the enormous effect it has. I work out every morning with my rowing machine, whether it's a high or low day, doing 35 pulls at maximum effort. Then I stop and catch my breath until I'm ready to go again. I repeat this process nine more times. 
On high days, when I'm eating, I have a, a first of two whey protein shakes blended in 16 ounces of water. A cup of strawberries and a half cup of blueberries and 25 grams of whey protein powder as well as five tablespoons of coconut butter. But on low days, I eat my protein shakes, all 61 grams of protein, all at once in 32 ounces of water with two tablespoons of coconut butter without the strawberries or blueberries. So that's when the two days, this is when the two days make a major slump, a split. On low days, that's it, I'm done. But on high days, it's a whole different story. After the shake, I go out and start lifting weights. I used to re recommend to you guys that you should lift just as much as you possibly can, but I'm not recommending that anymore. Granted, lifting is essential. There is no denying that. But when I had lost a lot of strength while consuming zero calories, I had to cut how much I lifted in half, sometimes even more. <laughs> that time period when it started happening though, oof, in the back of my mind, I was freaking out. <laughs> I, I kept asking myself if I was shooting myself in the foot but I found that dropping the weight was a blessing in disguise. Now, regularly, I wake up the following day and I'm pleasantly surprised. i am discovered my muscles I had worked the day before sometimes are incredibly sore. I mean, just like yesterday, oh. I, mean, I, I still, I worked out doing my shoulders yesterday and I still, I still feel it. I still feel them. It prompted me to start researching that, which as you know, I love to do. Then I found my answer. I can't deny the thing is more accessible when the loads are lighter. I mean, when I'm doing lighter loads, I mean, just my shoulders yesterday, I'm lifting lighter loads and it, I mean, it's, it's far easier to do, but there's more to it. It's where I found true benefit. When I do the lighter loads, I can extend my arms and legs as far as they can go. The first article I read said it all. Full, range, full range of motion resistance training is more effective than partial range of motion training to maximize muscle strength and lower limb muscle hydrophy. So, the thing lighter weights, yet performing the entire range of motion clarified the answer. Exercise, particularly resistance training in combination with climasting can enhance remyelination. Exercise reverses the degenerative processes of MS and promotes the development of myelin to meet greater energy demands. On top of it, anabolic steroids like growth hormone and IGF-1, which we all release during weightlifting plays an important role in stimulating testosterone metabolism and promoting thicker myelin sheaths. Now ladies, before you turn off, just remember, you also produce testosterone. In your own way, it does things that, for a woman's body that is different for a man's body, but the testosterone is essential for thicker myelin sheaths. And you, you don't produce as much, but you still produce a little. While exercise may not necessarily promote adaptive myelination in normal brains, in people like us who are fighting MS, 
is proven positive effects on the central nervous system and remodination. Looking at science, recent animal studies have indicated that voluntary exercise can encourage the creation of new neurons in the hippocampus and prevent age-related declines in cell proliferation. So getting back to my workout, I performed two waves of a full range of motion weightlifting. You better believe my muscles are sore. And, but when I get done, instead of pulling back and retreating while I'm lifting, I keep on pushing forward. At that point, I take a break after weightlifting and go in and consume an identical shake as I had the first time. You may think I'm done, but oh no, oh no, not on the slightest, not yet. I re return back to my rowing machine and do 10 more sets of 35 pulls. In the end, I'm just exhausted, but at the same time, I'm exhilarated. They are long, hard mornings. Yesterday was a long, hard morning. My body aches. You may think I wanted to go come into my room and lay down and sleep. But no, the opposite is true. I'm energized and want to get out and do stuff. It's funny how that is. Anyway, after the rowing, I come back and have my oatmeal, finally. Two thirds of a cup of old fashioned oatmeal, half a cup of pumpkin seeds, and three-fourths of a cup of walnuts. And as I said before, while oatmeal is mostly starch, dietary fiber can limit starch digestion. And at that time, on my high days, I've had 65 grams of fiber, negating starch's ability to influence my blood sugar levels significantly. Usually by that time in the morning, I have around 60 to 80 ounces of water, which keeps me well hydrated and is essential to maintain proper kidney function. That's essential for lowering glucose. I'm getting better, but I still, I cannot burn all the calories I eat on high days, but that's not even a problem, I don't think. The body uses calories more than just burning them for energy. A lot goes to repairing them, the, for repairing the body. And yes, even for rebuilding myelin. Just look at my graph, my Fitbit shows. The colored bar on the left side shows the calories consumed and the right side shows what I burned. Fitbit gets this via my watch, which records my heartbeat and other metrics. And as I've said, the difference between the two days is the amount of food I eat. I eat 4,160 calories on high days, but drop down to 1,530 calories on my low days. Remyelination does, and I, I want to emphasize, does require a calorie deficit. But it might, but I know it can be a permanent one. If you go too long with too few calories, the body will just slow down and to match. That's why people that are eating a thousand calories a day, they're they're if you saw what, what their metabolism was doing, it would be slow just like that. So to, to rectify that, my low, the slow days slash high days routine keeps my metabolism going strong, guaranteeing I will remain in a calorie restriction for clomastine to do its work and remodulation to happen. Working out has taken on a new meaning. Both on my Bowflex weight machine and on interval training on my Concept 2 rower, it's a secret ingredient most people quickly neglect. 
Wow. This routine. This routine changed my life. Clemastine, my diet, my lifting, my rowing. I can't tell you how great I feel. <laughs> I actually contacted my neurologist and up my clemastine prescription. With everything that I'm doing, I am certain remodelation is happening because slowly everything I've lost in the past 20 years is coming back. What is left to do now is to convince you that this endeavor, this big endeavor is worth it. And just me saying it is and my life has changed for the better, I don't think it's worth it. We're stuck looking at our MRI scans, thinking about our future, scared of the plaques, But speaking of plaques, we just stare at them. We take all of our symptoms effects on our lives and conclude that nothing more than just getting rid of those plaques will do. But <laughs> that isn't the case. I have a story to tell you. I had just started taking clemastine in December. Then Disaster struck on January 8th at the beginning of 2024. All day, I wasn't feeling good. I just felt crummy. I knew my household was getting sick and both my parents were sneezing and coughing. And I think, we, I just assumed we were all getting sick. But it was more, for me at least, that night, my simple cold changed. I woke up at 3 a.m., delirious. I tried to get out of bed, but it actually <laughs> ended up me being rolling out of bed and landing hard on the floor. I couldn't get up. I couldn't move. I just started yelling at the top of my lungs. I already started to feel like I was going to pass out as I heard mom rush into my room. When I returned to reality, my parents, both of them, were in my room and I heard dad on the phone with 911 before I faded out. When I returned, I glanced over and saw a woman attaching stickers with wires and a man talking to her about my vitals. I glanced down on my feet and I could see out the front of the ambulance and the lights flashing. I knew at that time, I knew something was happening and the answers would eventually come. So I just, I couldn't stay awake. I just allowed myself to dis disappear again. The next time I opened my eyes, I was staring at a white light. I heard many people in my room rushing around me, wrapping me, my body. I was lying in a hospital bed. Mom was sitting in a chair next to me. When all of them left, I turned to her and asked, what the hell just happened? <laughs> she told me when the 911 medics rolled me out on a house on my uh, house on a gurney, I had a temperature of 105 degrees. They didn't even offer my parents the option of driving me to the hospital. I needed to be rushed to the emergency room. With 105 fever, it can lead to seizures, brain damage, and even death. So, hence why my body was wrapped in ice bags. That's what they were wrapping around me was ice bags. She told me if I had not started, I had not started to respond until I had been 
wrapped for about 15 to 20 minutes. The ultimate cause of it all was COVID. And I was giving intravenous medicine to fight COVID. A few hours later, they, they rolled me to have an MRI done. I, not, looking back, I wish that they hadn't because it, was, it wasn't for MS, it was for COVID-19. But regardless, I didn't say anything. A few days later, I returned to the hospital and got my scans on a CD, as well as the radiology report. So when I, I brought it all home, I got loaded up in my, in, uh, my MRI reading or image viewer, I, at first glance, it appeared nothing had changed. Even though my MRI didn't show anything, I already started to feel something incredible happened. I had gotten over COVID and I was feeling great. Man, I think that was my pivotal moment where things changed. I don't know what test I needed to prove remuneration is possible, but I know there is one. The Cambridge study inadvertently gave me the answer. The ER trip, which started at the 2024, the beginning of 2024, it was only when I, um, within a few weeks after starting clomastine, and I was taking just one 2.68 milligram tablet a day. I was feeling pretty strong effects by by the time I, I looked at my MRI. So I, as I said, I contacted my neurologist, and I, and I started taking two tablets a day. And that's why I, when I contacted her and I explained everything, and I, she was kind enough to rewrite a prescription to reflect those two pills a day. It's unmistakable to me that clomastine is doing what the science said it was doing, it should be doing. I no longer care about the plaques. Yeah, I mean, my latest MRI at the beginning of 2024 showed they're still there, but things have changed. During my life with suffering from MS, I always wondered if I could ever feel normal again. And I'm feeling more normal than I have in 20 years. So if you've watched this entire video, listen to all my rambling, I've convinced you, ask your neurologist for a prescription for, for clomastine. As I said, I now take two, 2.68 milligrams a day. But just as important, I only feel these drastic changes because of my zigzag diet and exercise routine. And Partly be, because I feel so good and I know I'm, things are changing, I've stopped tracking my glucose levels. Not because I don't care. I do, but a pattern has emerged. And I feel as long as I don't make changes and everything stays the same, I don't need to spend money on lancets and test strips. But if you start it, and you discover your pattern, don't sweat if you get high reading every now and then. Take it as a learning experience and make small changes. Because I got a few high jumps. I mean, I when I started balancing them out, they weren't extreme. A blood glucose level slightly above the normal range is all right if it's done right after eating. 
all my walking troubles are going away. I mean, I initially thought I would say slowly growing away. No, I think they're going away. I mean, I'm not even thinking about walking anymore. I mean, I still have my occasional uh, imbalances, but I, I don't, I, I don't even think I'm gonna fall over. I'm, I think I'm taking life more slowly. Not because of the walking. I want to, I want to cherish everything life throws at me. My recovery is, more, is energizing me more than ever. Maybe what clamastine is doing to me is putting everything in this new, bright, beautiful perspective. I am so, so glad that I've done everything I've done. I'm talking to my, to my patrons more and more about Clamassi nowadays. How about this ha Why don't you join up my Patreon? I think all of us would love to chat and add you to our, our chat and discussion. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss a video. Until the next one.